let's hit it. And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about. And welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I hope you're going to enjoy the show today. We're going to be talking about rays of hope during times of transition because grief and loss sometimes can really take over. Now, before I introduce our guest today, I always like to welcome new listeners. Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We like to hear everybody's story. So, those living with a diagnosis, family who are caring for somebody, maybe it's professionals that are caring and serving them, advocates, um, researchers, movie directors, singers, songwriters, authors, and so much more. It is important to share stories. I think that's the way we learn to heal, the way we learn to feel we're not so alone in this desolate world that sometimes is called dementia. Now, our opening song was called Clarion Call. It's by the Mark Arneson Band, and you're more than welcome to go ahead and download that on any of your favorite music platforms. I want to give a couple of shout outs before I introduce our guest. First is to Dementia Map, which I am so honored to be working with Dave Wiedrich on this global resource directory. It has wonderful, wonderful services, products, tools, and stories, and so many people out there willing to help and we've just scratched the tip on this one. So go check out DementiaMap.com. I also want to give kudos to the Memory Cafe directory which happens to be uh, Dave's little baby. He has de developed five directories for five different countries. Uh, these are fantastic ways for families who have a loved one with dementia and have a care partner join others. So they develop this peer support and it's not all about dementia. We talk about all of life, just like you would with your own friends. You are also more than welcome to join Arthur's Memory Cafe. We do that every second and fourth Wednesday. It's virtual now with COVID. So just reach out to me if you would like more information. I also wanna mention Coral Health because they are still allowing people to download two of their music apps, Music First and also Coral Faith. You can go to CoralHealth.com, that's C-O-R-O -O, Health.com. And now we're going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker and we will be back and I will introduce you to Susan Zimmerman. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle? to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. So today I am so so excited to have our guest with us. Susan Zimmerman it has a unique combination of licensing for um, marriage and family therapists, and then she's also a chartered financial consultant. She consults and writes about therapeutic growth and is the author of six books and just published this beautiful one called Rays of Hope, 
lighting the way in life's transitions and losses. And Lord knows we're all feeling that right now for sure. And it's all about helping us live our best lives through the adversity that COVID has brought into um, into our lives. So welcome, Susan. I'm just, like I said, I'm just thrilled to have you have you on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Lori. I really appreciate what you do and your bot podcast. So I'm glad to be here. And just a little disclosure, we know each other for, I don't even know how many years, but through the National Speakers Association. Early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's been a while, but we haven't, we haven't chatted. Now, one of the things I always ask everybody um, when they're on the show is if they've been personally touched by any form of dementia in their own family or circle of friends. You know, I was thinking in terms of the first generation above me, no, but my grandfather, my maternal grandfather did end up having that. And back in the day, it was in the late 60s. And so he became essentially hospitalized mm -hmm. for all of that time. And we visited him quite a bit. And I remember some some really, really tough visits because he he didn't want to be where he was. And yet he needed the care. Yep. And who the heck wants to be there? You know, right, I mean, right. none of us are going to sign up for that one um, yeah. on our own. That's for sure. Oh. Well, I would love for you to share with our audience um, first a little bit about why and how you got your diverse credentials, because we usually don't see those packaged together. Because I think that has sure. a, um, a, a big statement about who you are and how you look at life. Well, thanks for that question. I, I appreciate the the interest actually because the combination is is unique. And before I was doing financial planning and financial education, in, that's what my speaking programs were about. I was a, so, a software developer for wellness programs, and so I always had this interest in wellness, physical fitness, stress management, and nutrition. And the, the financial part came in as a form of wellness. And it was in my seventh year of doing financial planning, I had a founding partner who happened to be my husband. And we've been at it for 33 years and have a bigger company now. But the, the thing that was cool is I always wanted it to be a very nurturing process for clients because most people don't have complete comfort with financial strategies and things like that. And maybe you weren't brought up with it when I sure wasn't. <laughs> That's part of the reason I wanted to learn more. But uh, the, the client who called me owned a mental health clinic and said their marriage therapists had so many couples who were fighting about money and they really felt like they needed someone who knew about money and was a professional around financial matters. So she asked if I would see these couples who were arguing. And I felt like, that's great. This is part of why I'm doing what I'm doing is to help couples get on the same page with money, find <clears throat> financial harmony. So I, I agreed to see these, these couples that were being referred by the clinic, but they were much different than our financial planning clients in that, the, especially the first couple ever, wouldn't you know, <laughs> stormed in and, and sat on opposite ends of the, our long conference table, which made me feel like I was watching a ping pong match because they kept tattling on each other and battling to each other against each other. And I wasn't sure I would ever get out of there without, you know, collapsing first. So I, I knew that I didn't want to feel like I was guessing my way through that conflict resolution piece. And that's why I went to graduate school in psychology and family therapy and couples therapy. And it was tremendously helpful. So that's the kind of long answer, but boy, could I tell stories about the education, but it really did it really brought it full circle and has helped tremendously through the years. And I can imagine, you know, just any stressor, if it's if it's a divorce, if it's a medical condition like Alzheimer's disease, things get complicated really quick. What do you do? How do you do it? How are you respectful? How is it balanced? How is it safe or fair? And you know, trying to project future needs is never, ever easy because none of us have that crystal ball. Now, you know, when you studied um, conflict resolution as well, that had to really add to the whole grief and loss specialty 
because again you do have to mediate those types of things out in therapy or just in general business you know like you said with your with your uh, financial planning company but mm -hmm. my guess is you know was there a, a personal story behind that at all or oh yeah aren't you insightful <laughs> Well, there were a couple of things. I, I mentioned that my own parents were kind of different personalities about money. So that was part of even wanting to understand the psychology. But the grief and loss part, while I was in graduate school, my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And this was the first you know, significant close person who we were going to leave. And it was a rather slow process. It wasn't the kind of cancer that treatment was going to save the life. And he began talking about deep, deep things from childhood and other sadnesses he had had that he had never given voice to. And that was really challenging too, because I didn't know how to be a consoler for him, but also help him deal with some of the sorrows that he had. It was a really new side of him and here it was at the end. So grief and loss coursework helped me understand what was happening and know that all of it was common and not, you know, not crazy or anything like that. Because sometimes you feel like you're going crazy at certain aspects of it. So that's why I studied grief and loss and made it a specialty. And you know, when you say about feeling crazy, and people do, because we don't talk about the dang subject. We have exactly. to talk about this. And your book is done so beautifully. I mean, it is just stunning. The, the pictures, the nature just gives it this therapeutic calming edge. Um, mm -hmm. You've got poems and acronyms to help us remember, you know, helpful tools. I mean, it really is just, just wonderful. And I'm yeah. wondering if there's a, a lot of times when people write a book, there's a backstory to the book <laughs> as well. Because, of, you know, as I tell my listeners all the time, a book is not easy to write. This is a labor of love, no matter who is doing mm -hmm. it. Um, I have... I have two that are still in the womb, but I just haven't, I haven't found the time or the energy to birth them. But every author I've talked to talks about, there's a story that says this has to get out. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, part of it was, uh, one of the phrases I sometimes use when I'm confiding childhood things is growing up on what I call the diet of quiet. Mm -hmm. because quietness was highly valued and commanded in the household I grew up in. And so it was kind of not safe to be anything but quiet. And that was true when there were deaths in the family or with close people to the family. And the first time I ever heard my dad cry, I, I was about six years old and, and I had never ever heard him cry before and never again since. But I did ask him what's wrong, what happened? And he said, Bill died, he killed himself. And Bill was his best friend. And that was all he ever said about it. And I never saw him cry again. I never found out, of course, your child, they're not going to confide all kinds of detail. But it gave me kind of a, a confusion and a curiosity at the same time. And so in a way, I did study it a bit to try to understand for myself what does this all mean and how do people get through it and what helps and what isn't helpful? Because a big part of why I've written this book is to help people make decisions that are good for them, healthy for them. It's There were times my dad would have drinks and you know that was like his escape. And But he, he really didn't talk about the deep things, like I said, until he himself was you know suffering with a terminal disease. And that's pretty common. That's pretty mm -hmm. common. When you, when you talked about the quietness, I, uh, you know, and that that was pretty much your household, you know, not to speak yeah. of. I grew up in a household where my mom was really big into death and dying. And, and so her oh. friends would tell her, you know, you can't be bringing them to the funerals and the wakes. They're, they're just way too young. And well. she, I mean, she was shamed and scolded from her friends. And my mom was very adamant. And she would say, you know, they need to celebrate life coming in and going out. And Good. I don't want them to be surprised that 
people yeah. die. She's like, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. And right. there's lots of different reasons people die and it's going to happen to every one of us. And she, yeah. she was just very adamant. I want my children to be prepared. But I remember that scolding. And even in my mom, in the end of life, she, she was big on, on still having people involved. And so this is a little off topic, but I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Actually started coming to me in dreams. And so, you know, one okay. morning, it was two in the morning. She's like, you better finish that a bit, Laura, because I'm not hanging out a whole lot longer. And oh, so my like, gosh. Okay. And then another time she came and she said, you know, you're not going to be here. You have other things to do. And I need to know you're going to continue your work. And so when she was actively dying, I actually flew out to Arizona. And my whole family thought I was having a nervous breakdown because I was her primary caregiver, except my daughter. My daughter understood. And yet she had everything perfectly aligned for me to continue my work. I was doing two keynotes, found out how I could engage fully through Facebook, you know, chat, video chat. I didn't miss a beat. I mean, I was there for helping them through, but not doing the hands-on things. I was there to, you know, put my older brother in line when he would get the whole group rattled and no one, no one kind of would put him in his place. I could do that and then they'd all break out laughing and kind of cut to the chase. I could guide them on mm -hmm. what to do, but not do it. I mean, it was just, it was really, really something. Boy, how important that was for her, for people to learn that lesson. And wanting mm -hmm. it to be shared. I would just picked up your book and it had transitions of love with this beautiful picture, you know, with the seagull flying over. Yes. I want you to talk a little bit of, of why you laid the book out the way you did and then maybe share a special piece with us. And then I, I have more questions, of course, but I just think that your book is designed so beautifully. Thank you. Let me try to hold up the page you just referenced. I appreciate that you're, you're asking that or, or wanting to show the picture. That's one of my favorites, although I have a lot of favorites. I designed the book to, to have nature photography. It was coincidental at first. I started writing uh, poetry about grief, loss, and transitions after a significant loss in our family and noticed that some of my nature photography seemed to fit perfectly alongside it. And next thing I knew, people were saying, you need to turn this into a book because we all need something that's beautiful and soothing and invites us in. So the nature photography was carefully selected throughout to go with the different categories of loss and the specific examples of different types of transitions or loss. And the soothing element welcomes people who are having a hard time in because even a nun called me one time. Someone had given her the book as a gift when her mother had passed away. And she shared that she wasn't able to read her favorite books like her Bible. And that the poetry and the, the shorter therapeutic narrative made it a simple process that just continually welcomed her in. So, and poems, you know, have a soothing, but also an element of opening up to joy heart to them. I know that I was influenced in my childhood. It seemed like the only book I had as a little kid, and it probably wasn't, but it was my favorite. So it's the only one that was in my heart, was a poetry book, A Child's Garden of Verses. And one of the poems had this beautiful cherry tree picture in it and it said, up into the cherry tree, who should climb but little me. And I just always felt soothed and happier when I would read, the, read those poems of Robert Louis Stevenson. So uh, did you want me to share a couple of the, the types of rhymes or? Yeah, I would love you to. That would, yeah, okay. that would be wonderful. Yeah. The, um, well, one of the ones that there are a couple things that we need to find while we're, whether we're caregiving, which has its own form of grieving losses, because usually whoever it is we're taking care of, you know, may not get better. So we're grieving potential losses there, but it requires courage to move through that. And one of the things I've said to all of my clients all of the time is fear is part of the journey, but the, the, 
way that fear is our friend is fear is what helps us discover our courage. So the, the poem that's called Devoted Courage is the path to courage is blazed by fear. We can't have one unless the other's near. Persistently then towards each will steer, embracing both and holding them dear. So that's the Arima therapy for being okay with being afraid. It's part of being authentic really. And that's how we find the little brave sides of us. And then another short one that is also perpetually helpful. Um, now I'm an introvert, but everybody has times when they don't feel like talking, whether you're in a, a business meeting or even, you know, I've, I've certainly been to grief and loss groups. Sometimes you think I'm just gonna be quiet, but uh, so I wrote a poem about that where I found my way to a quiet place intent to not speak a word. And then I heard the soothing voice of grace who inspired me to be heard. So it's a, now see that goose, I've got goosebumps and <laughs> sometimes these poems that were written a long time ago still sink into me like it's something new. And it isn't even like I wrote it. So I figure if I'm still getting goosebumps and it's old news to me, then maybe it's helpful to people who are going through grief and loss. So that, that's a two for now that I give you a taste of it. <laughs> I love that you mentioned the importance of being authentic. I think we live in a world where people, you know, hide and they, you know, they develop these personas that's, that isn't them, their true selves. And I think that does such a disjustice to not only themselves, but those around because People are thinking this is who they are, and then oh my gosh, they're not. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a um, a bad blind date online, you know. Well, they told me they were this and they were that, and then <laughs> and then they're not. And that's one of the things I've tried to do through my work is is to be authentic, to laugh and cry with people, you know. To it's okay to be mad and to be joyful. It's it, all of that is all right as long as you're, in yes. my opinion, as long as you're not hurting anybody. And mm -hmm. I find that it's easier to move through. The grief and loss when you actually allow yourself to feel it instead of stuffing it down stuffing it down or you know yeah. boys aren't supposed to cry or whatever it might be or i need to be strong for others and we forget about ourselves and our own soul and what we need to heal and your your poems um are so powerful uh, i got i got the chills too when you were reading Did you? reading it yeah and and pointing out, you know, the fear and the courage, you know, it's a yin and a yang. You can't really appreciate one without having the other. Mm -hmm. You just yeah. can't. And you so, really can't. It's, yeah. it's that old two sides of the same coin type thing. Yeah. yeah. And so both are a gift in their own way. One feels a lot better than the other because it's not, <laughs> not scary. I don't care if it's fear and courage or if it's joy and sadness mm -hmm. or if it's feeling full or empty or I mean you can go on and on with all of that stuff there's always yeah. one side that's uncomfortable but yet it allows us to learn and to be authentic and to appreciate how much we really appreciate the other side of the coin <laughs> you know? yeah sure no kidding well and that's part of the what helps make the journey a little easier too is is appreciation but also just noticing those little things that you are grateful for like, oh, gee, I feel a little better in the last five minutes. Sometimes it's just that short of a time period. Yeah. But note it, noting it. It is really important. You know, when I went through the loss of my, my mom and dad, um, those are probably the two closest people that I've lost. And, mm -hmm. you know, it took me a while. I didn't really appreciate this totally when my dad died because I, I, I looped. I looped and looped and looped and I kept yes. living. Um, his right. death, um, even though it was a real powerful moment and, you know, I was thrilled that I was there. I just kept reliving it and I couldn't get out of it. And then I realized, you know, I'm feeling so connected and I was so connected to him and what a gift that amount of love and connection is. Yeah. You, know, you can't, you can't feel the sadness and the loss at the extremes that you do if you don't have it at the other end. Right. So exactly. That, that thought True. always helped pull me out mm. you know, a little <laughs> bit. And that's what I think your, your poetry and your 
um, your pictures do is really help pull people out and and say again this is normal you're not the only one going through this and you know with dementia it doesn't have to be loss of a physical body you know there's ambiguous loss constantly from somebody maybe not being able to drive or do finances or maybe they have to go to adult day or move into a community or maybe they just can't do a hobby that they used to or they always cooked on friday nights and now they're not so a care partner or a family member is constantly feeling those things as well as the person with dementia is mm -hmm. going through those so your book i mean there are so many different transitions we have we mentioned divorce but it could be moving for a job or loss of a job or you know a, a child being an empty nester yeah. uh, becoming even becoming a parent even as joyful as that is you know you kind of lose your individuality that you had before and the world a no lot of freedom <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the world no longer circles around your needs and wants priorities change so there's so many different levels of transition and i think sometimes we we look at grief and loss when people think about it they they think end game somebody's physically mm -hmm. gone and died and Yet we deal with this every single day in our life and on some level. And, mm -hmm. and I, think it, I, think, I think your book will help raise a consciousness so it's not so scary. I hope so, Lori. Yeah, thank you for that. I, that is definitely one of the goals I had is just because it is a topic that most of us haven't had open conversation about until something significant is lost a loved one, but even a favorite thing, you know, that sometimes it's a tornado that tore your house apart. You know, it's, it can be any kind of tough, difficult change that happens in life. It's going to be a grief cycle. In fact, when you were talking about looping around, it made me think of one of the acronyms I share in Rays of Hope is the acronym NEAR, because some people have, have heard about the five stages of grief, of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know, the first one is denial and so on. But when, when you have the foggy brain of grief, because that's a normal part of it, you can't remember the complicated stuff. So I turned it into the acronym NEAR because grief is always going to be near in some respects. So there's two meanings there. But then the, I turned it into four stages for numb is the way it starts. And numb can be part of the denial or even just the shock. But then there's emotional. So the E in near is for all the various emotions, so many of which we've never experienced before. Maybe there's a form of betrayal that we're feeling that has never happened before and it's baffling and painful. And then adjusting. That's when you're, you've moved through the, the difficult going through the motions part and, and frankly going through the emotions and that adjusting is just when you're starting to take steps that integrate in what has changed. And then finally, the R is for rebuilding, because any time we have a grief cycle, it means that something has changed that feels quite significant in our life. And we have to rebuild a, a little different path for ourselves. So the NEAR acronym is a helpful one for people to easily gauge where they're at and they flow back and forth. Like you said, they loop around like a garden hose, <laughs> you know, and uh, so not to get discouraged if, because it isn't a linear progression where you go from A, B, C, D, it just doesn't work that way. Well, and I love that acronym and I love that you pointed out the numbness of it could be denial or it could just be you're in shock, you know, or somewhere in between that and the emotions mm -hmm. of, it could be a new emotion or it could be emotions that you've experienced, but they're just more extreme because you're not centered during that time. You know, you're just, oh, yeah. just kind of kitty wampus on things. And sometimes I think we we perceive things were better than what they were. You know, we forget sometimes sure. about bad times. And so then it, it makes the loss even bigger and, and more difficult. Right, right. And that can be like a pendulum that swings both ways where sometimes it's things seem worse than they were and sometimes they seem better. And somewhere in there, there's a little more accurate element of it. And part of it is just being patient and, and knowing that you don't have to know 
every moment of every day what's going on. I think that's an important thing. Living in the present. I have an acronym for that, by the way. It's one of my newer ones. <laughs> and the living in the present acronym is NOW for Nurture One Wisdom. When you're going through something tough, don't try to make sense of a whole kaleidoscope of things, but think of one thing that you found to be wise or helpful in your life or something someone said or a time you had a strength that surprised you or didn't surprise you, but you were able to access it. And take that one wisdom and, and be with it and allow yourself to like, like my mother just used to like to read. And so one wisdom would be in my case, I think I'll just read for a while, something easy. I mean, you know, if you're struggling, something that's easy, not too heavy, not too dense. So now is a good, a good acronym to hang on to, I think. I love that one. And I think that there is so much wisdom through the process too. One yeah. of the things I used to always ask myself is what's the lesson? You know, <laughs> what am I supposed to learn from this? Because apparently yeah. I'm not I'm yeah. learning it. I'm still frustrated. And so once you once you kind of grab that wisdom and you you know what your lesson is, it's like there's this calmness and and you can really feel, I think, a whole different level of joy and comfort once once you're able to pull that now together and yeah. get that little gem. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, and don't be shy about it, share it, share it. <laughs> you know, yeah, other, share it. Other you people. might help someone else. <laughs> exactly. Just like you've done with with writing this book and, and putting this all together. I wanted to talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of a rhyming therapy and how that how that can help heal and, and make us feel as well. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. Yeah. I thank you for that question, too, because the, the poetic part of this is very near and dear to my heart. And I, I had gone to a wellness conference one time and there was a whole lot of aromatherapy around at, in the exhibit hall and I remember I was also working on some poems for a book I was writing at the time and that's when it came to mind oh what I'm doing is aromatherapy it's not aromatherapy but it's therapy that's coming out of a poem and so one of the cool things these days is that there have been many studies that have confirmed that poetry lights up the brain. This is from MRIs and so forth. And the brain responds to poetry in a similar fashion to music being played and listening to. And what it does when the brain goes into that state is it makes you more self-reflective, able to gain insights, in a way that you wouldn't have been otherwise, and also even problem solve. So it kind of gets you out of the alarm center of your brain and allows that, that creative part of all of us that actually can, can live if we let it. And uh, it, it really is helpful, like I, like I said, with some of the other poetic examples. And I have one that I wrote specifically in thinking about COVID which is at the end of the book, but I think this might be a good time to share that one if you think that makes sure. sense. Yeah, oh. I'd love for you to do that. Yeah, because a lot of the COVID loss is about intangible things. Now, uh, certainly uh, it's over 500,000 deaths. So we know there are millions of people who have lost a loved one and are grieving specific people. But there's also just a lack or a loss of familiarity, certainly a loss of being able to gather, obviously, the way we did. And then there's this thing I call social confusion, which is everything around, well, do you say something if someone isn't wearing a mask or is wearing a mask? And, you know, just what is considered a social gathering that changed over time. So there's just this social confusion and, and periodic confusion that seems to go on and on. So we've lost those things. And... I started sketching out this poem and ended up with one and it's simply named Hope. It was once a wish, a love, or an aim. Holding tight didn't secure a forever claim to familiar comforts of nothing changed, of never having to be rearranged. Amidst the turmoil, along came new hope, slowly nudging us up the steep slope of coping with loss and changed conditions 
lighting the way for our new life's transitions. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah it got me a little teary eyed there because it was just like it, it is. It's so poignant and really, um, really draws a picture that's quite beautiful. You know, I loved earlier when you were talking about how poetry is much like music and it's taken a long time for people and researchers to really, you know, say this yeah. is this works and now people are really embracing music so i hope more people will embrace writing and reading of poetry i do too it just frames the world a little bit different and yet it attaches and connects us to others have these same emotions or these same struggles or these same joys and same feelings and i think that in and of itself gives great comfort to push your way up that slope. Because I think one of the worst times when you're dealing with loss is when you feel no one understands. Well, and for sure, you know, psychologically, one of the most important things we all need throughout our life journey is validation, at least now and then. And when we're going through something that's confusing or, or causing us to be in despair, we certainly need validation more than ever with that. And I think that's kind of built into one of the acronyms that is, I think, probably the most powerful in the book. They all have great psychological value, but hope is the acronym that I created for what are the four habits of hope? How do we get through this? Because it dawned on me when I was going through some of the most significant grief periods that I had in my life that we we have to be able to notice that some hopes that we had are in fact gone. And so, but getting through grief is about establishing, well, there are some new hopes that are just starting to formulate. So the HOPE acronym starts with honoring the journey that we're in, having respect for that journey you know, and being open to what it is teaching us. And the P in hope is for persevering. Just keep going even when you feel like giving up. Yes, rest. Yes, take good care of yourself. Yes, take time off. And then finally, E is for encourage. And encourage is back to that courage question again. Encourage means to infuse courage. So we need to take in courage so that we give ourselves some helpful, hopeful habits to get through each day. And I wanted to mention, you had said uh, quite a few times about gaining joy or celebrating joy. And I couldn't agree more. And I, it made me think of how important it is to give yourself permission to laugh, even when you're terribly, terribly sad. I've had so many people tell me they feel guilty laughing when they're in the midst of in intensive grief. And I, I think of the story when my dad was in his final, you know, 24 hours of hospice care. And we were, my sisters and I were feeling sad that his best friend hadn't been comfortable to visit him. And towards the end, when my dad was still conscious, thank goodness, his best friend stood in the doorway. He had come to visit after all. And we were all so overjoyed that we burst out crying. And then, and there were four of us in the room at that time, four daughters. And after his best friend left, we all said, poor Tom. And then we burst out laughing because we thought, really, the poor guy didn't expect all of my dad's daughters to start crying in unison. And uh, so the laughter was very relieving and as were as was the crying. And sometimes they come right next to each other, don't they? Oh, yeah, that is so true. I, I'm a big believer in that too. Uh, honor, open, persevere and encourage. I love acronyms. I think they're so powerful. When you were talking about near, I was thinking when you were talking about um, the rebuilding, I was thinking of a group that we created called the Caregiver Reentry Program. And so it was a support group for those that ha have gone through this loss. And it, you know, it's so important because they are lost. They don't know what to do. They don't know who they are anymore. Um, their identity kind of came almost like their occupation. When people retire, a lot of times people don't know who they are, you know, which could, exactly. which could be a loss and grief in terms yeah. of 
whole process as well. And um, and then, you know, I was a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter or a friend, and that isn't anymore. And then who mm-hmm. who am I? Um, oh, yeah. it's a, it's a tough thing. And I, I think that's part of the loss and grief that a lot of times isn't talked about is who am I? Yes. And so often you're, you have been a consoler for the person you're giving care to and other people who love that person. And yet you're grieving too. You're grieving the potential loss and then the actual loss. And those two roles flip back and forth. And then you know, when the, when you've lost your loved one, it's, it's just multiple, multiple confusion that, that can really take a whack out of your confidence and certainty of knowing where you're going. Yeah. I just had this conversation, um, with my dementia chats group this morning, we were talking about emergencies and kind of life and death situations. And, you know, somebody had said, well, yeah, but I don't like to ask for help. And I think in this situation is the same. People don't want anybody to know that they're struggling. They, you know, want to appear self-sufficient. And yet many people loved being that consoler for Mm -hmm. whoever they're caring for and, you know, find that they get more out of it than probably the person they're caring for does, you know, just like they say with volunteering. And yet, society has this mentality of I'm not going to let you in oh no kidding yes and and, you know we have to get over that big time um because it it just makes the journey harder and then sometimes it twists things up and all of a sudden we're thinking well they don't care well they tried and they've asked you 25 times and now they're just not going to ask you 26 times right Right. You know, oh. Any help with people in terms of reaching out or being able to to feel that they can show another side of themselves? Because sometimes people think, well, I'm the strong one. I don't want anyone to see me like this. Yes. Well, one way that because I'm one of those people, too, that I don't want to. I mean, I, I really got this from my own mother who did not want to be a burden. And I took, you know, I was very involved in her care the last eight years because she moved here from out of state. So the tip that I had, if you have that tendency, is what helped me is I turned it around to tell myself, it's a disservice to others if I don't ask. I mean, if there's something I am confused about because of what they said or didn't say, it's a responsibility to ask because it's a disservice if you don't, that the open communication is nearly always going to result in something positive. Now, I'm not talking about conflict. I'm just talking about this, the, the topic you brought up, which is being able to bring up things that you aren't accustomed to speaking about yet, just hanging on to that piece that what you have about your life, what you've learned along the way is valuable. And you want to keep the communication in an open flow. It's back to that open and hope. And um, part of it is just allowing yourself to test out ways of being that are a little bit unfamiliar. It really is about protecting the relationships that you have. If the shoe was on the other foot, what would you expect out of them? You know, and why, why doesn't that uh, fall on your foot as well? You know, because people are sensing, even though we might not say it in words, they're still reading all our nonverbals. They're seeing what's going on. They're mm-hmm. feeling something's off kilter. And we, we have to help people open up and have those conversations because both sides are struggling. Even when we yes. think we're protecting by not telling. Yes. We really, we really aren't. Uh, sometimes it, it, we have to admit that it's our discomfort in the conversation mm-hmm. first that's holding us back. Yeah, and you can certainly t- send out a little test balloon by asking a pre-question to your question or a, a question before you disclose something that you feel insecure about by saying, you know, I've had something on my mind that is rather personal would you be okay with having me bring that up and tell you a little about it? And, you know, they may reassure you so much that you feel completely at ease. And then likewise, they may say, well, right now isn't the best time 
and they may say why or they may not but then then you know whether to go full steam ahead or to just postpone and i would always say you know the net the follow-up question would be could we postpone it and maybe revisit the question and see what comes out of that i i like that bubble question i've not heard that before but that makes a lot of sense and you know, a lot of times, I mean, people are honored when you're willing to share something that you haven't shared with others. I mean, that, that I so. when it comes to a friendship, I mean, that that's a true honor to be that mm -hmm. trusted. And yet, um, you know, maybe another thing to even add in there is I, I'm not asking you to fix this. I just need to be heard. Oh, sure. Yeah, because, that's a great because, thing to say. Yeah, because sometimes people will think, oh, and now I got to fix it. And a lot of times people aren't asking to be fixed. They're just mm -hmm. asking to be heard. And that's a good, such a good point, Lori, in, in workshops that I've taught about this, where I have a section about what not to say <laughs> and what not to do. It, it really emphasizes that listening is the primary thing you're going to do. And I created this quick formula for how to be an ace listener. And it's you know, of course, asking questions, but then knowing you're going to confirm back and then just encouraging. And so when when some if you're listening to someone who's grieving, the, the key is in listening mm -hmm. and reflecting back some of what they're saying. You don't have to have some brilliant wisdom about what, you know, what they should do next or how to think about this loss or, you know, some of the worst things are people that or, or things that are said that are actually not helpful, but you've heard them over and over at funerals or whatever. Like, you know, well, at least you have other children, things like, you know, certain things that just are not comforting. If anything, they they make the pain feel like there's just been some salt in the wound. And it's better to, to say less than more. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's hard to know. I remember my my dad made a comment to my son and his wife when they had a miscarriage. And it was very innocent. And he just, you know, said, apparently God felt this baby wasn't wasn't ready yet. They harbored that for years. I don't think they ever told my dad. Oh, wow. How, how much that hurt. And he mm -hmm. was just trying to comfort them. It's really hard to know what to say. And, and sometimes people just need a hug. True. And, and well, and it brings back the, the point about what people need the most is validation. And so... The simplest thing you can do is say, this is so hard. I'm, you know, by acknowledge what's painful, difficult, hard and say something simple like that. Yeah. Some of those, anytime you try to cheer them up with almost anything, there's good possibility of it backfiring because the, the pain is over the loss, what is gone. I think we need to learn better about validating uh, people's feelings. But I think as a society, we don't do that because we're so uncomfortable in that mm -hmm. moment um, because we're not used to people being authentic because we don't really allow that a lot. And so we just want to move them out of that space. Sure. And, we, and we don't even know that we're doing it for ourselves. We don't mm -hmm. even really acknowledge the discomfort that we have. There's so much work we have to do on ourselves. <laughs> you know? Yes. I had a friend who lost her daughter and she and I were talking one day and she said, you know, one of the things that she's most okay with hearing is somebody saying there are just no words because that's so true. When, when something profoundly horrific has happened, there really just are no words. Yeah. And just to know that they're standing by you. Mm -hmm. there. Mm hmm. Yeah, and, and telling people I'm here to listen anytime for you and that's helpful too. And of course the people, when the, the loss is fresh, they they don't have any idea what they want. So the last thing they need is to be pummeled with questions about how they can be helped. You know, what can I do to help? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and to, to not give up, I think a lot of people, especially after a funeral, they're like, well, they did their due diligence, you know, they went and they paid their respects. But, you know, a lot of times people don't even get into, you know, their full sorrow for three to six months, sometimes a year yes. after because they're they're busy being busy mm -hmm. trying to fix and maneuver stuff. And so right. um, or, or knowing and appreciating the fact that every single holiday 
is mm -hmm. going to bring this all back up every every special occasion that they had. Um, that's yeah. something that's normal. Right. And sometimes there is, a, as far as losing a parent, there are adult children who might be senior citizens themselves, but yet they're having to do the work of settling the estate, which is, you know, not fun mm -hmm. at, at best. And so they don't feel like they have a way to have any closure until that is done and finished and out of the way and they can quit thinking about it and quit working on it. So yeah, there's just a number of things that can cause grieving to be put on hold and you you don't necessarily know when it's going to come back. But that's one of the main things that I've said is that it is unpredictable. So be ready, like I said earlier, maybe to be crying one minute, laughing the next, but just when the certain emotions pop up that you totally didn't expect, just expect the unexpected because that's about how it's going to show up at different yeah. times. I love that you talked about putting the grief on hold while you're processing the estate because that is so true and that is something people don't think about again. You right. know, it's just we get this task list in front of us of all the things that we have to do, all the people that we have to contact and, you know, merge and change yeah. and, you know, it's it's a lot. And then you then you have belongings and those might have a time frame that, you know, needs to get done at a, at a certain thing. But it reminds me a lot about dementia, because for me, I was a big task girl. And every every day I would print out my to do list and, and I would feel good putting those little checks down. And then and everything on there, you know, was primarily for my folks, you know. And so, of course, I was giving good care to them. But what I realized was I wasn't maintaining our relationship because I was so task oriented. And the, the point of this being is that we need to take care of ourselves, too. And sometimes we can get trapped in the task. Oh, and, for sure. And not feel whatever it is we need to feel in the moment, not giving mm -hmm. permission. We have this inner critic that just like keeps pushing us you know, and is this taskmaster and and we don't take time to to care for ourselves. And part of that is because we don't even know how. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, it's so true. And and different people, you know, everybody's grief is unique and every individual is unique. So some people need to cry and cry out in, you know, more frequently, whereas others can process through it with silence and it, it varies tremendously. So it's, it's really being in tune to what you, as best you can perceive what your body needs from you. Uh, sometimes tension, the feeling of tension in your chest is a sign that you need to cry, that tears need to be released. They have a healing sensation and a healing power. And the other thing about tears is I've had people say, I'm afraid to cry because I'm afraid I'll never stop. And biologically, tears have a natural cessation. You're never going to cry forever. It, it's just easy to feel like you will because the, the, the grief is so palpable. But uh, knowing that the tears will stop and it's like time to not worry about being in control. Yeah. And some people, you know, grieve, I, they're just mad. You know, like you said, they feel betrayed. They're upset. Why did you leave me? You had no right. Or why didn't you tell me this or guide me through this? Uh, you know, there were things they didn't know. Um, yeah. All kinds of things in, in family relationships. You know, they, they maybe they weren't the best. Maybe they were strained to begin with. And, sure. and still, if someone hasn't had time to heal that relationship prior to death that can cause some issues um, mm -hmm. and as you had mentioned some people might turn to addictions you know if it's mm -hmm. alcohol or drugs or shopping or sex or so many to pick from these days you know? forget food <laughs> yeah, food food yeah that's fine that's fine i think being being conscious of what is your body calling for and why Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes we ignore the why, even though we know what it is, we just don't want to go there because then, oh my gosh, and we, we might have to sit down and really figure, figure out a better way. Yes. This just makes me feel good and, and numbs the pain. 
Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been a great conversation. Have we missed anything or is there another oh. piece that you'd like to share? Uh, let's see. Well, I think we're good. The, the one acronym that I didn't bring up might be worth just finishing with. And it, it has to do with the, the possibility of doing some journaling about your, your grief journey losses, because um, part of it is about getting a grip on the growth that we are forced to experience when we've had these life losses or life transitions. And I turned getting a grip into an acronym, which matches up with some of the best therapeutic journaling you can do. And it stands for the G is to write what is gone in your life. What, you know, it's just a free flowing, scribbling out anything that occurs to you that's gone. Like you mentioned the miscarriage. One of the things with a, a baby or a pregnancy that's lost is all of the dreams you had going into the future are gone. And it's acknowledging those. And as painful as it is to acknowledge them, it actually slows down the swirl of losses that seem infinite and they seem like they're everything. And then the R in GRIP stands for what remains. And you're writing out then, okay, what do I still have? It feels like everything is gone, but it isn't. Okay, I still have family and friends who love me. I still have an ability to get up in the morning and make meals or whatever. It's just logging everything that you still have so that you don't feel so hopelessly lost of everything. And then finally, what is possible? That's the IP in GRIP. And the what is possible is when you really start to integrate in some of the meanings you've started to have about the loss of this situation or loss of a loved person. And it brings you hope for the future. Remember I said earlier, part of grieving is realizing you're gonna have to generate some new hopes of your own because life for you isn't over. And how do you bring it, bring it into new hopes that are going to make you feel purposeful and fulfilled and just soothed and happy? So that's what I would add for the, the journaling component. I like that because it covers the past, what's actually happening now, what you have, <laughs> which so often we overlook. And then, you know, like you said, what are the possibilities in the, of the future? Because they are endless. Um, there's lots of yeah. things that we can do. And, you know, our lessons in grief can can help develop those as well, if we choose, you know. Yeah. Maybe and, and uh, you know, maybe there's a whole whole nother path out there waiting, another chapter in your life. And you, you get to write that. You get to create and, and formulate what that's going to look like. And that's, um, that's a huge gift. And writing, using your hand and actually writing on the page the old-fashioned way does have benefits to the brain. So you don't have to be a great writer to do journaling. It's just whatever thoughts come to mind, they're all good to have, good to get out, good to write. Well, and I, I found that too. I do much better with a, a pad of paper than trying mm -hmm. to write on the computer. I mean, for business writing, but when I'm trying to like write stories or get creative, it's just different. And then I go back and half the time I can't read what I wrote because I can't read my writing, you know, but then it makes me process, okay, is this really what I wanted to say in yeah. there, you know, and, um, and then I can go type it up, you know, afterwards. Mm -hmm. I had um, one woman on the radio show um, and she was amazing. Her husband has been living with dementia a long time. And so she started writing haikus and somebody gave her a haiku journal. And she's like, a haiku, I don't know what a haiku is. And she says, <laughs> the next thing she said she knew the very next day, they were just coming out of her, just pouring. And so she was like in the middle of the grocery store, writing on her grocery list you know, her haiku, her poem, and, you know, on napkins, and it didn't make any difference. She said it was just like this almost rebirthing, and it just gave her this calmness. And I think sometimes people think, oh, you know, poetry is, it's too foo-fooey, but anybody can write it, and it is a way to process emotions. Right, yeah. yeah. And acknowledge and, and save things in a, in a way. And again, you don't have to share it with anybody if you don't want to. 
Mm -hmm. You don't have to do a raise a hope book like Susan and be brave <laughs> and, and share it with the world. It can be something that you just have for yourself and put in a little box in your closet, or maybe you just write it and release it. It's um, true. Yes. And, and, and sometimes you just never know. I mean, the raise of hope book started as just poetry and reflections that I had and they started expanding. And so you just never know where yeah. it might be. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. One of the things that, that I know I do a lot is when I write, uh, a lot of times I'll do like a burning ceremony. And so mm -hmm. when I find something really special, I will, I'll burn it and then I'll um, take the ashes and put it out into the wind and just ask God in the universe to move it forward for me. And I have always found that just so healing for myself. And I know some people think that's kind of wacky and that's okay. You know, um, I love that. I, I think coming up with rituals just to try out what will help you feel soothed and you know, allow further insight to happen in your life. I think those rituals are more important than ever, especially, you know, back to COVID. But with the the typical ways that we've had funerals changing so much, I, I have really been advocating for thinking of little ceremonies or rituals you can do just like that, burning something and letting the, the ashes go flow out in your yard. That's, that's enough. And, and say what you most will, will miss or already miss or loved about the person who's gone or the situation is gone. I remember doing it in a hotel in a coffee pot on the balcony. And so I would set all the smoke alarms one time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then I, I let them cool down and I put them in an envelope and then I went out to the ocean and then I released them the next day there you know it's just it's amazing all the different things that that you can do and and the more you can let your body heal you know through acknowledging what yeah. it is you are um going through at the moment and and realizing that those emotions are normal they're probably going to be heightened but again it's normal yes it is and it uh, something you said reminded me to to bring up forgiveness because that's a word that is sometimes defined for, for people in a way that makes them reluctant to feel like anything that's going on is forgivable. But the best definition I heard of forgiveness is to release an expectation that's causing you to suffer. So very often, if you think about it, that's where our greatest suffering and frustrations come from is in reality, we expected life to be a certain way or we expected a loved one to be with us longer or whatever and it, it you had mentioned being mad i think that's why i remembered the forgiveness definition again is sometimes what we have to forgive isn't a person but a situation and when we release that expectation that can't be met and maybe never can be and that's where you could do a burning ceremony again you release it so that you can begin to to stop having that focus and expectations a lot of times we're not fully conscious we even have them until something we expected is gone very true very mm -hmm. very true well susan i can't thank you enough for spending this much time with us on alzheimer speaks radio um, your book is brilliant i highly recommend people go pick this up if not for themselves for someone else who's going through loss and we all know someone who is going through yeah. loss, probably multiples. And you can reach Susan by going to Susan at mindfulplanning.com or to her blog, raiseofhope.us. And if you want to purchase her book, you can go to the website, which is mindfulassetplanning.com forward slash books dash and dash resources they can talk with you personally if they want to do some bulk rate purchasing and stuff yes. it's for a conference or maybe it's for your own family you know and circle of friends that you want to give this as a gift it's it's a really really powerful powerful tool we do send them uh as gifts to entire families when they've lost a loved one and it's like better than a bouquet of flowers because it's a lasting gift mm -hmm. so yeah, it, it really helps. And I I only can say that with confidence because so many people have told me that. <laughs> I don't know if I could have known for sure on my own. Yeah. So thank you, Lori, for 
that. That makes sense. And I, I like, uh, I like, I think I'm going to do that in the future. I like giving the book versus, versus the flowers and stuff. Cause you're, you know, mm -hmm. there's just so much out there and it is nice to have that, that little something after the fact. Well, you know, it's true too. Like we talked about how sometimes people don't know what to say. And so I've helped people who are buying the book and they, they've said, what do I say? And I say, well, how about Please accept this as our gift and expression of deepest sympathy. Mm -hmm. you know, it's simple and you're giving them the book as a gift or you can write it in a card. And it's a simple, just please, please accept this as our gift. Yeah. And expression of deepest sympathy. So that's because it's hard to know what to say as we've talked about. For sure. Well, thank you again so much. Yes. And thank you to our listeners here on Alzheimer Speaks. I hope you like, click, and share this to the moon and back. This is an important conversation that we all need to have. And, you know, we just need to be more authentic with what we're feeling and what we're going through and acknowledge not only what we're going through, but what so many others are going through as well. There's lots of different transitions in life, and you never know what stage someone is trying to hammer through.